In today's A-level IB biology video, we're going to be looking in great detail at HIV. Now, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. AIDS is a disease which comes about later as a result of HIV, and it stands for Acquired Immunodeficiency Syndrome. So as you can see, we've got quite a complicated pathogen here, and I'm going to talk about HIV and the virus, what type of virus and how it affects our bodies, and how that HIV, after several years, leads to the fully blown AIDS. So as I've said, HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. As we can see, it is a virus, and it's actually a retrovirus. So how does HIV enter our body in the first place? Firstly, sexual intercourse, and that has to be unprotected. It can pass from mother to baby, either via the placenta or breastfeeding. It can be caused through infected needles, so that could be intravenous drug users, or even, unfortunately, through blood transfusion. If those needles haven't been cleaned properly, then for sure HIV can be spread like this. But what effect does HIV actually have on the body? Now, the HIV infects helper T cells. And as a side, we need to talk about what helper T cells actually do. Now, helper T cells, as the name suggests, they help to activate B cells. And B cells are incredibly important. Why? Because they secrete antibodies, which remember, can go and help destroy the pathogen. So if you're infecting these helper T cells, then you're not going to be activating enough B cells, so you won't be secreting enough antibodies. They also help to activate macrophages. And macrophages help to ingest pathogens. So another very important function when it comes to helping remove pathogens from our body Basically what we're saying is that if those helper T cells are effectively defunct, they're not working, then we're not going to be activating B cells and we're not going to be activating those all-important macrophages. Now I thought it would be super helpful to go over this graph from the BioNinja website because it's super helpful in helping us understand how that HIV later leads to AIDS and the effect it has on the human body. So we can see here where the infection occurs, so week zero, that initially the helper T cell count falls and that's up to around week five. It then starts to pick up a little bit. If we look at the amount of HIV in the blood plasma, we can see it goes from being zero to increasing rapidly. And make sure you're looking at this side of the scale to understand the sort of numbers we're talking about. But effectively, the T helper cell numbers decrease and the HIV numbers increase and then rapidly decrease. So you have this period called clinical latency which takes place over several years, whereby it almost looks like you've gotten rid of HIV. After all, the numbers have dropped significantly and the T helper cells start to recover. However, unfortunately, you get this dropping off of helper T cell numbers, while at the same time, the HIV numbers begin to increase in the blood plasma. And you get this terrible time at approximately nine years after that initial infection, where the HIV numbers totally spiral out of control and you see a total plummeting in helper T cell numbers. And at that point, if the patient isn't treated properly, then it is quite likely that death will occur. So we're going to write that now below a description, so saying what we can see from the graph. So for the first five weeks after infection, helper T cell numbers start to decrease, HIV numbers rapidly increase. From week six to nine, HIV numbers decrease dramatically whilst helper T cell numbers start to pick up. For the next seven years, there is a period of clinical latency where there appears to be no activity from the virus HIV. From year nine onwards, HIV numbers spiral out of control and helper T cells numbers plummet to zero. So I know I've written an awful lot there, but I really wanted you to understand this graph and what it's showing. The fact that we have these two scales, one showing the helper T cell numbers, one showing the HIV numbers, and you can really see how the two sets of data track each other over the course of infection of this awful virus. Now, why do people die, seeing as for this clinical latency period, we really don't have any symptoms at all? And that's all due to constitutional symptoms. Now, constitutional symptoms are a pretty vague set of symptoms that are associated with HIV, but people are known to suffer from these symptoms separately from HIV. So if you have this symptom, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have HIV. So what do these symptoms include? Well, it's symptoms which are as vague as having a fever, a chill, general tiredness, so that's fatigue, night sweats, 
and weight loss. And you know you can suffer these sorts of symptoms from any number of diseases, but what is it that actually kills people? Seeing as these symptoms seem pretty basic, they don't seem altogether super dangerous. Well, it's due to opportunistic infections. Now, usually a healthy person, when they get the flu or a cold, this isn't something which necessarily kills them because they are not particularly vulnerable. But the problem with HIV is we know that it leads to the destruction of the helper T cells, meaning that the macrophages and the B cells can't work as effectively. So really, at this point, the opportunistic infections can really take a hold of the person and can cause far greater damage than in a healthy person. So the body becomes susceptible to opportunistic infections and this can result in death if those infections are not managed appropriately through adequate healthcare.